Hello and welcome to Access Asia. Coming up, China's Evergrande announced that its founder is being investigated for illegal crimes. It's the latest twist in the ongoing saga of the world's most indebted property developer. They risk their lives for their livelihoods. The impact of underground fires at coal mines in eastern India, burning for over a century, are a threat to the locals and their environment. And what's in a name? India or Bharat? Both are terms for the same country, one in English, the other in Hindi. But the latter has taken on an increasingly political and nationalistic tone. The founder and chairman of Evergrande is being investigated for suspected crimes. For more on this story and the implications it could have for the development giant, as well as the Chinese and global economy, I'm joined on the set by Solange Mejean. Hello to you, Hello. Uh, Solange. Let's start, first of all, with what's happening with Evergrande and its founder. Well, to put it quite simply, both are in deep, deep trouble with potentially the bells tolling for Evergrande. We don't know that yet, though. It is pure speculation. What we do know is that the founder, Hoi Kan Yan, is under police surveillance. Evergrande released a short and rather vague announcement saying that mandatory measures were being taken over suspicions of illegal crimes. Now, this probe is not a sudden fall from grace uh, for the real estate tycoon. Kuhn, who was actually once known as the Belt Brother because he wore a gold Hermes uh, belt at a legislative conference. Now, the 64-year-old went uh, from the status in 2017 of China's richest person with, 40, with a fortune of $42 billion to, in 2021, uh, the status of the world's most indebted real estate developer. Uh, he has since kept a rather low profile um, and, as well, uh, uh, now, with this investigation, this is the first signal by Beijing that he is the one who could potentially be held accountable for Evergrande's uh, crisis. Yeah, and speaking of that crisis, let's get into it. There's some hope of a restructuring plan? Yeah, prior to 2021, Evergrande was one of China's top uh, uh, top selling developers, uh, leveraging uh, their projects to get investments in new ones. This, uh, uh, for example, this is, for example, people buying homes on spec. But then in 2021, it missed a $100 million payment deadline. Its cash problems became public, and it went uh, into default on its offshore debt. Now, Evergrande's total liabilities are mind-bogglingly huge. They're thought to be over $300 billion. And since the crisis, Evergrande's been working uh, on restructuring those hundreds of billions that it owes, which includes a two, $20 billion in international debt, and investors are expecting, uh, investors, they were actually expecting to vote on a restructuring plan, but now it looks like that may no longer be in the cards and actually a liquidation uh, might occur instead. If Evergrande collapses, what does that mean for China and for the global economy? Well, with Evergrande's default in 2021, it is thought to have it was thought to have 1.5 million unfurnished homes uh, in the works that year and in the following one. It lost over 80 billion dollars. So it's everyday Chinese people uh, who could lose all or much of their down payments uh, on these homes that they desired. And then there are companies uh, in the building sector that uh, uh, still are old money, and not just from Evergrande. Other developers like like Country Garden and Sunak, they're also strapped with colossal debts. So these developers have eroded a trust, and they've also added to a larger crisis uh, in the Chinese real estate sector, which makes up a rather significant portion of the China's economy. It's thought uh, to be around a quarter of China's economy. So now the government is looking to reboost that sector and show people uh, that they are tackling the problem. As for the global consequences, well, there's a hefty uh, foreign debt, um, but a report last year by Europe's central bank found that the demise of Evergrande would not be uh, akin to a Lehman Brothers. Rather, uh, it would have two times less of a chance of massively hurting the global economy. Uh, rather, it is mostly mom and pops in China uh, that will be hurt by this, leading to Xi Jinping, uh, his catchphrase, reprimand this summer, housing is for living, not speculating, and thus Beijing's move uh, to clean house of sorts and to build the sector back up again. All right, Solange, thank you very much. Uh, Solange Moujon. 
For more than a century, underground fires have been burning in coal mines in eastern India, threatening the lives of locals and creating an environmental hazard. Complicating matters is the fact that millions of people depend on the coal industry. Monty Francis reports. With no more than a scarf to protect her face, 22-year-old Savitri Mato shovels coal, surrounded by flames and smoke, in a landscape that many who live here describe as hell. We live in fear every day. Accidents have happened before, and they keep happening because the land is sinking. The land is charred because of the fires. It's dangerous to live here. The houses can collapse at any time. Savitri is one of some 100,000 people who illegally shovel coal near the burning mines in India's eastern Jharkhand state, risking their lives to make a living. Scientists believe a mining accident more than a century ago in 1916 sparked the flames, and they've been burning underground ever since, over an area of some 300 square kilometers, creating sinkholes which have at times swallowed up people and their homes. It's estimated that hundreds of people have died over the decades. Many others have been left with life-changing injuries. When I was 10 years old, I was in the coal fields and went to go to the toilet. The land sank in and my mother rescued me from the rubble, but my hand and leg had to be amputated. Coal consumption in India, the world's most populous nation, has doubled in the last decade and now powers nearly 70 percent of the electric grid. The head of the commercial mine operator, a subsidiary of the state-owned Coal India, said the company was not responsible for people working in the mines illegally and has tried over the years to extinguish the fires without success. We are aware that we have responsibility towards the society as far as this environment is concerned, as far as this health is concerned. State authorities began relocating people from the mines in 2008, but many people are still waiting for help, like this man who lost his home to a sinkhole. Life will be hell if we have to stay here. I'll be forced to live on the streets like a beggar. This will be my fate if the government or the coal company won't help us relocate. Many endure the brutal conditions because they say leaving means losing their livelihoods. This woman's teenage daughter died while working on the coal fields four years ago, but says she has no choice but to stay. When I go to gather coal, I'm always scared that I might meet the same fate. But I'm helpless. If I don't go, what will I eat? And what will my children eat? India's appetite for coal is only growing. Burning it accounts for about half of the nation's CO2 emissions. One local trade union leader said at its current pace of production, the burning mines could endure for another 200 years. When India's Narendra Modi opened the G20 in New Delhi in early September, he introduced himself not as a prime minister of India, but of Bharat. In fact, both names are official. Bharat is the Hindi name for India. But the former has taken on overtones of Hindu nationalism ahead of next year's elections. This report from our correspondents. It's the latest controversy to hit the country. The government might change the name of the nation to Bharat, a Hindi word for India. Both the names are mentioned in the constitution, but it's India that's more commonly used. People have a mixed reaction to the proposal. Bharat summarized the big uh, history of our country, which is like more into the Hinduism. They've made a proper diversion on this. Now you ask anybody, they'll be just talking about the changing of the name. Nobody will remember the objective is to fight against unemployment. This controversy started during the G20 summit in early September when the dinner invitation sent from the president's office to the world leaders read President of Bharat. Also during Prime Minister's speech, the nameplate in front of him read Bharat as the country name. According to this historian, the Hindu nationalist government wants to get rid of the colonial legacy. 
even when the name was in use much before the British came to India. Where it suits the narrative, the idea of decolonization is being brought in, but where it doesn't suit the narrative, you're willing to keep idea that came up during colonial times. In the name of history, uh, it is actually the politics of our times that is, um, uh, that is playing out. But the opposition parties believe the sudden push for using a Hindi name by Narendra Modi is to exert his Hindu extremist agenda, which can benefit him in next year's general election. Bharat and India were used interchangeably. What they have done is kind of brought it to a level where one is in conflict with another. They want to own that religion. They want to turn it into something called Hindutva and give it certain kind of ideology, certain orthodoxy. We contacted the ruling party, the BJP, for comments. They refused to talk to us on camera. But they confirmed that there are no plans to officially change India's name to Bharat. Now, sometimes when you travel, there's on-screen entertainment, but passengers on one Japanese bullet train got something far more immersive. Take a look at this. Pro wrestlers Minoru Suzuki and Senshiro Takagi, two big names in the sport, battled it out in the aisles, chokeholds, pile drivers, and more. Fortunately, the match was the only thing that was off the rails, and onlookers knew what they were in store for. Tickets sold out in just 30 minutes after going on sale. Note to self, bring spandex the next time I'm on a train, just in case. We'll leave you with these images. Thank you for watching, and please stay tuned to France 24.